getting through blankets and laying. We all came in after we got started. I'd like to welcome you all here that came in late. I wouldn't, wouldn't call anybody out, but it's good to see you, Liz. <laughs> <laughs>
beginning not being uh, true faith and we begin to see it developing and opening up and it's pretty amazing as you watch the steps Jesus interacting with this nobleman and you see all that takes place but the unfolding of faith is quite uh, entertaining if you will quite moving spiritually now I want to preface this with saying this I truly believe in miracles. We have seen a number of miracles in this church, but I don't have trust in miracles. I have trust in Jesus. Once again, I believe in miracles. Always have, always will. But I don't have trust in miracles. I have trust in Jesus. Let's read the scripture. John chapter 4, 46 through 54. Once more he visited Cana in Galilee, where he had turned the water into wine. And there was a certain royal official whose son lay sick at Capernaum. When this man heard that Jesus had arrived in Galilee from Judea, he went to him and begged him to come and heal his son, who was close to death. Unless you people see signs and wonders, Jesus told them, you will never believe. The royal official said, Sir, come down before my child dies. 
Jesus replies, go. Your son will leave. The man took Jesus at his word, departed while he was still on the way. His servants met him with news that his boy was living. When he inquired as to the time when his son got better, they said to him yesterday, one o'clock in the afternoon, or some translation says the seventh hour, the fever left him. Then the father realized that this was the exact time at which Jesus had said to him, Your son will live. So he and his whole household believed. This was the second sign Jesus performed after coming into Judea to Galilee. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your word. Father, we thank you so much that uh, your word has recorded this. <coughs> that we just see the de development, the growth of faith. And Lord, I pray now that I may decrease, that you may increase in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So it started out like this. The man started out with secondhand faith. Watch this. Verse 46. Once more he visited Canaan and Galilee, where he had turned the water into wine, and there was a certain royal official whose son lay sick in Capernaum. When this man heard that Jesus had arrived Galilee from Judea, he went to him and begged him to come and hear, heal his son who was close to death. This man had heard of his miracles. He had heard of him uh, uh, changing the water into wine. All he had really at this point was hearsay. He heard that Jesus was a miracle performer and that he indeed, and listen, there's nothing wrong with this. My goodness, if I had a child or grandchild, I would uh, go to whatever means I could to have God move in their lives. But he came beginning with second and faith. Secondly, he, did, he had a sign to, do, do, he had a demanding faith. In verse 48 it says, unless you prepare, see signs and wonders, Jesus told him, you will never believe. Demanding faith. Now, Lord, now, do it. Uh, uh, now Jesus would be a better way of saying it. In Matthew 12, 39, it says, A wicked and adulterous generation asked for signs. You ever thought about this? Some people say, if I just had a sign. Oh, I would believe if I just had a sign. They even said this to Jesus on the cross, if you remember. Come down. If you come down and you save yourself, we will believe. Sign. Sometimes even today there are people that says to God, if you work a miracle, then I can see and I will believe. The problem is not signs and miracles. There's nothing wrong with that. John records them and others record those miracles that Jesus performed. It is the demanding of signs and here's why. One, it's dishonest to God. If some of you have probably done this for your children or your grandchildren. You say, I'm going to say, put $100 into a savings account for you. And then when you're 16 or whatever, I'm going to, uh, uh, that money can be used to buy yourself an automobile. That's a good thing at 16. So, so I'm going to continue to make deposits in that account. Well, what if your child said, Dad, I, I know that, you know, you're probably going to do that, but could you give me a deposit slip just so I can have record that that is what was done? And, and if you can follow up with a deposit slip each time, 
That would just make me know that that indeed is what is happening. And in the same way, it's, it, it's God, I need a, I need a sign. It, it, it dishonors a dad because <coughs> the dad, where a child says to the dad, your word is not good enough to me. You may say it, and I want to believe it, but I need a sign. Number three, secondhand faith, a demanding faith, and then a self-centered faith. In verse 49, it says, the royal official said, Sir, come down before my child dies. Now, you have to take this with a little grain of salt. It does self-centered because he's interested solely in his child. It is interesting that he is concerned with the child's welfare. Nothing wrong with that. Absolutely nothing wrong with that. Don't, don't get me wrong. You, you have those concerns, you take them to the Lord. That's okay with God. God's pleased with that. But again, at no time did the Father say, I have come to worship you. It is a self-centered faith. People have a tendency to be concerned with health, finances, relationships, and the future. You know, I talked about this earlier, and I said I mentioned this. Worship is simply enjoying the presence of God. I don't know about you, probably the majority of you. A lot of times I hear from people say, "Well, you know, when I don't go to church, it just..." And I'll talk about this often, but, you know, there's something so special about coming together with your brothers and sisters in Christ. And just to worship in the presence of God. Where two or three are gathered in and saying, there he is in the center of them, there he is in the middle of them, and this morning, God's presence, the Lord's presence is here today. Now, that's not to say he's not with us all the time. But, folks, there's something special about coming together. Isn't it? Amen? Amen. Just say, oh, Father God. All of this. I, 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 Father, I don't know how health may turn out. I don't know how relationships may turn out. I don't know how my financials finances will turn out. All I know God is I just want to be in your presence and I worship you. I worship who you are and who you say you are because I believe that. The fourth thing that was a challenge, you had a strong willed faith. Verse 49 again the royal official said sir come down before my child dies. He is instructing the Lord. Come down now because my, it was a son, is dying. Jesus replied in verse 50. Go, Jesus replied, your son will live. Now I know it sounds like I'm being a little hard on this gentleman. Because we, we have to understand the circumstances of a child that is dying. Or a child that is dying. But you know, our prayer should really be, Dear Lord, speak to your servant. I'm listening. Not, Dear Lord, listen up. I need this and this and this. Oh, how God wants to hear from us. Dear Lord, your servant, dear Lord, is listening. Speak to my father. In verse 50, he heard the word of the Lord, and now it's starting to develop. He heard the word of the Lord, which was, Go, Jesus replied, Your son will live. 
The man took Jesus at his word and departed. You begin to see faith developing. You begin to say what he did, he took Jesus at his word. Now in verse in Romans 10, 14 it says, Now then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? Verse 17 in Romans 10 says, Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word about Christ. You need to know what the Lord has said and what he is saying. It's all about the word of God. It's about knowing what he says, what he has said, and what he is saying to us. And it's in this love book. So we see he heard the word of the Lord. Second, that I've also already mentioned, he believed the word of the Lord. Not only did he hear it. Now, now think for a moment. He's, he's standing there just right in front of Jesus Christ. And he sees Jesus there. He heard the word of the Lord. Then he believed it. Um, now, this sometimes is where people say, well, you know, that's where I get a little hung up. It's believing. I mean, you know what the Bible says? That is not a brain thing. It's a heart thing. You'll see our brain can play tricks on us. But it is knowing someone says, I just, I can't get my head around it, right? Now the Bible says you can't get your heart around it. That's the problem. It's not an intellectual issue. It's a heart issue. Hebrews 3, 12 to 13 says this. See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. But encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Unbelief is not weakness, it's wickedness. Faith is the heart's response to God himself. That's pretty strong. Faith is the heart's response to God himself. Not based on what God has done, the man looks into the eyes of Jesus and is captivated. Do you get sort of, I don't know if this is the right word, but do you get sort of captivated when you're in prayer? I mean, you're really at the throne of God and and, and, and you're looking at the Lord and it's just, it's so captivating and everything seems to flee away. God created my eyes, your eyes, to see light. God created our ears to hear things. To listen. God created, now watch this. God created our souls to want to have faith. Isn't that amazing? God created our souls to have, to respond to the Lord. That's what our souls are created for, to respond to the Lord. And that's the reason souls get restless sometimes, but it's about responding to the Lord. So one cannot say, I just can't believe if I could just get a miracle or something. No, God has already created us, our souls, to respond to him. So he heard the word of the Lord. He believed the word of the Lord. And then he obeyed the word. 
verse 50 and 51 says this. Go, Jesus replied, your son will live. The man took Jesus at his word and departed. Verse 51, while he was still on the way, his servants met him with the news that his boy was living. The man is doing exactly what God told him to do. Remember at first, God, here, do this, do that. Now, as he, as he now believes in the word of the Lord, he is doing exactly as God has told him to do. He is going. Now, I really thought about this. If, if I had a child that was that was dying, or a grandchild, and Jesus told me that he's going to be okay, would I say, I got it? I pause because I think are you sure? I traveled 20 miles. I can't just leave. But he did just that. I, I, I was supposed to say can I see the deposit slip? No, it's there. It's done. James 2.26 says this, As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. So we're saying faith alone will not save you because there's always been a big debate right there. It is, is it faith alone or is it faith that works? Uh, is it works alone? Is it faith that works? The um, faith alone will not save you. Well, it's not true. It will. However, in James 2, 26, it does say a body without the spirit is dead. So faith without deeds is dead. Always with faith comes works. Faith didn't save you. But when there is true faith in God, there will be works. Now I'm not going into a whole a whole list of what those works may be. That's between you and God. Now this is always peculiar to me. If it's been 24 hours of eyes and said, go, your son will live. 24 hours. As I mentioned earlier, Galilee to Capernaum is about 20 miles. Chances are this guy being a nobleman probably was in some kind of chariot or on a camel or something. And even if he walked it, you would think eight to nine hours at the most. But in a chariot or a camel, which was very likely, would be two to three hours. And then why 24 hours? Well, this just amazes me. I tell you what, if, if Jesus said, your son, your grandson is alive, when I turn around, I will be given everything I got. Right? I want to get back and see that indeed is he alive. Indeed has he come back or has not passed away. How fast would you want to get home? But watch this. In Isaiah 28, verse 16, this gentleman and the development of his faith 
he came to a point, now watch this, it just gives me chill on this. He rested in the Word of God. Rested. That's amazing. I mean, I thought it would be the anxiety dropped a little bit, right? But I still haven't got home yet. Isaiah 28, 16 says this. For this is what the sovereign Lord says. See, I, stay, I lay a stone in Zion, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone for, sure, for a sure foundation. The one who relies on it, now look at this, will never be stricken with Because listen, we're all humans, right? And we're going to have anxiety. And there's going to be times that go, there's going to be some panic going on. However, it says here, in resting in the Word of God, that He will never be stricken with panic. Psalm 37, 7. Be still, or some translation says, rest before the Lord. And we wait patiently. Do not fret when people succeed in their ways, when they carry out their wicked schemes. I just find that first part of that verse so overwhelming. Be still. Rest before the Lord. And wait patiently. You know, I know in my own life when things are going and, and, and uncertainties are coming in, it is only in those times that I can just sort of get away from everything and just get me and God and me and the Lord, me and Jesus Christ, through the Holy Spirit, can I even begin to get some rest. And folks, many of you know that. It's the most unbelievable time. I believe we're getting a glimpse of eternity, a glimpse of heaven. Because I'm just resting there. And there's times I will say, I don't want to get up from this, Lord. Just let me rest. And he will. Now, in conclusion, in John 4.53, it says this. Then the father realized that this was the exact time of which Jesus had said to him, your son will live, so he and his whole household believed. But hold on, we read in verse 50 that he already believed, right? The man took Jesus at his word. This is even stronger belief. This is belief that to his family, I have seen the Messiah. I have heard his word. And I want you to know about this man named Jesus. His whole household was saved. I mean, really, when you look at it, what good would it have been if that young man and would have been saved from death, but never saved for eternal life? And let's close with this verse. Psalm 107, verse 20. He sent out his word. You know what that's saying? That? Now he sent out his word. Think about that for a moment. You know, sometimes I go, oh, man, I just... Because we do get in these moments where we just say, oh, Jesus, if just something could be a presence, if you could show me something, an angel, or something could come down, could I just know that you are actually here? 
he sent out his word. That child was saved, was healed 20 miles away. Well, he sent us a letter. And he's always with us. He's always beside us. And that's what faith is. He sent out his word and healed him. He rescued them from the grave. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, know that you are a God of miracles and we have witnessed that and God I believe in miracles and I believe we always should pray for thee Father I believe your desire is to not get so wrapped up or trust in miracles but to trust in you so, Father, today, may we commit, recommit our lives to simply worshiping you, knowing that in your hands, you will take care of us. In Jesus' name I do pray. Amen. Let's uh, stand, please. Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. Blessed be the name of the Lord.